You are listening to Catholic Family Podcast. Greetings, fellow travelers through the liturgical year. This is Lisa Davis with another Feast Day Quick Take, celebrating the feasts of St. Therese of Lisieux, which is on October 3rd, and St. Francis of Assisi, which is on October 4th. Holiness is irresistible. If even 10% of the world's population had it, the whole world would be converted and happy before the year's end. So said C.S. Lewis. I do believe this. Unless you are an enemy of God, to know the saints is to love them. Like a rainbow or a beautiful sunset, a holy person draws the eye. Sometimes I think we don't know why. Something in their demeanor, their story, the very fact of their existence in the world— touches or amazes or or humbles us, like natural wonders which are solely God's handiwork, but better. A saint is a miracle of human will cooperating with divine will, in spite of everything the world throws at them to try to trip them up. How can we not find this irresistible? These two saints are so irresistible that they found their way into the consciousness of non-Catholics and even those worldlings, God bless them, who skim the surface of the spiritual life with what you might call an appreciative eye for a saint that jumps off the page and can be made to blend in with modern ideas. St. Francis of Assisi and St. Therese of Lisieux are in this category, so attractive that they're universally appreciated by Catholics, of course, but they've also been squeezed into a worldly narrative that doesn't see much past the surface. I guess the question is whether this is something to be irritated about, or is it a good thing? What is it that makes them so irresistible that they've had such an impact on the world? How do we get in on this to be part of that 10%? Let's take a look, starting with St. Francis. St. Francis of Assisi sells millions in garden centers worldwide, the outstretched stone hands of his statues blessing gazing balls and flats of petunias everywhere. Inevitably, somewhere on his person, he'll have a little stone bird perching or a fawn leaning against his robes, which isn't an insult to our saint or a misrepresentation. Our Franciscan founder did preach to the birds and the fishes when people refused to listen to him. But here's the problem, in my opinion, with these yard ornaments. You'll almost never find evidence upon them of St. Francis's true blessing, his claim to fame, so to speak, the marks of the nails in his hands and feet. St. Francis was the first saint known to have suffered the honor of the stigmata, and make no mistake, it was something he really suffered. They were wounds that caused him constant pain. They weren't figurative. The statue makers faithfully reproduced that peaceful smile, but it's uncommon to find the marks of the stigmata on these statues. Fact is, the image of St. Francis as the nature-loving peacekeeper is the tiniest puzzle piece of the man. It may or may not be an injustice to St. Francis, but it is a loss to us when we skip over the wounds and zoom in on the bird perched on his finger. For a real proper zoom in on St. Francis, many great authors have detailed his biography, including G.K. Chesterton, and The Perfect Joy of St. Francis by Felix Timmermans is a favorite in our family. But for our purposes, seeing as this is a quick take, here's a bird's eye view of today's patron. St. Francis was born Giovanni di Pietro di Bernardone into the family of a prosperous merchant in 1181. He led the life of a spoiled rich kid until the horrors of war, captivity, and illness brought home the reality of his mortality, leading him to a complete conversion at the age of 24. He adopted an ascetic life of prayer and penance that immediately attracted like-minded young men. In 1209, he composed his first simple rule to organize the increasing number of followers who had been attracted to his life of pious simplicity and his devotion to the poor. Pope Innocent III endorsed his order of friar minors in April of 1210. In 1212, St. Francis, with St. Clare, founded the sister order of the Franciscans, the Poor Clares, and he instituted an order of tertiaries as well, known as the Third Order of Brothers and Sisters of Penance, shortly thereafter. In 1219, St. Francis journeyed to Egypt in an attempt to end the Fifth Crusade by converting the Sultan leading the Muslim army. 
His intention didn't prove fruitful in that regard, but St. Bonaventure tells us that the Sultan, because of the influence of St. Francis, did convert to the faith before his death. In 1223, St. Francis arranged for the first live Christmas nativity scene, a custom that quickly spread throughout medieval Europe and is still performed to this day throughout the world. His friars became known as emissaries of faith and charity, who merited graces for the world by their penitential lives and their spirit of prayer. Though the first Franciscans had their share of difficulties in regard to the structuring of the order and the strictness of the rule, God blessed the order with many vocations. As the order increased, St. Francis, whose health had deteriorated, chose to decrease, withdrawing for the most part from public view in his last years. He received the stigmata in 1224 at the age of 43, and died just two years later, with his holiness literally stamped upon him. Never ordained a priest, he died a deacon, just another humble friar of the order. He was canonized by Pope Gregory the Ninth in 1228, and was named patron of the Franciscan order and of Italy. Through the centuries, he's also become known as the patron saint of merchants, of animals, and of those who work with animals. On the Feast of St. Francis, many parishes provide the blessings of pets in his honor. St. Francis's love of nature in general is no lie. We know by his beautiful prayer, the Canticle of the Sun, that nothing about the beauty of the natural world escaped him, because he associated it entirely with God his Creator, around whom Friar Francis every thought, word, and deed revolved. For God he was all goodness, for God he was all humility. And in light of his humility, I think he'd want me to mention that the famous prayer of St. Francis, which begins, Lord, make me an instrument of thy peace, though undoubtedly in the spirit of our saint, was not written by him. The prayer appeared first in France in 1912 in a magazine called La Clochette, or The Little Bell. Originally called simply The Prayer of Peace, it was written by a Father Bucure. At the express request of Pope Benedict XI, it was published on the front page of the Vatican newspaper in 1916, a much-needed message of peace in the midst of World War I. In the trials of World War II, it rose again to the surface, and somewhere during this time, it became associated with St. Francis of Assisi, certainly with no ill intent. The message of peace through humility and charity was something that St. Francis would certainly endorse, but Father Bucure wrote the prayer, not St. Francis. No harm, no foul. Peace is always a good thing. But it was not the core of St. Francis's endeavors. The desired result, yes, but not the purpose. Anyone who saw the real St. Francis in his lifetime understood his holiness as dogged hard work and sacrifice. He was a man who never compromised where God was concerned, but always bucked the conventions where the world was concerned, not a hallmark of a peacenik. He stood out like a sore thumb in a patched brown habit, begging for the poor. But he'd give you the shirt off his back if you needed it, with a gentle smile, and best of all, the benefit of his prayers. He was irresistible in the 13th century, and he still is. His gentle countenance won over a generation of hippies in the 60s who adopted him as a patron saint of peace at all costs, though his stated method for ending the Fifth Crusade was to convert the leaders and thus end the war. No other solution would suffice for this man of God. And while it's fair to recall his serenity and his love of nature, St. Francis's serenity he found in the stability of God's will, and his love of nature was bound in the providence of God's creations. Far from being the effeminate hippie, the patron saint of the ecological movement that the world plants in its border gardens, St. Francis, in his sacrifice, embodied the courage, discipline, and manliness of the most heroic soldier, while simultaneously owning the most difficult attribute in the lineup of virtues, humility. Often called a second Christ, everything about St. Francis contradicts the worldly world, just like Christ does. To those who don't know the whole story, the pretty picture of St. Francis, his serenity and simplicity, make him irresistible. That and the animals catch the attention. But for those who look past the surface, as a model for practicing Catholics, 
It's St. Francis's fight to perfect himself, his courageous sacrifice, and his all-encompassing love of God that make him irresistible. The legacy of St. Therese of Lisieux suffers from a similar fate of modern-day popularity. Along with St. Francis of Assisi, she's pretty much recognized everywhere in the Western world. After Lourdes, the Basilica of Lisieux is the most popular place of pilgrimage in France. As a modern era saint, we are able to see her real countenance in photographs, and she's a great favorite as a subject for artists, her pretty smiling face and armload of flowers front and center in Novus Ordo gift shops. Like St. Francis, her natural world analogies of the spiritual life give her a sidestep entrance into the psyche of the somewhat spiritual eco crowd. Pleasing to the eye, easy peasy, fresh and squeezy, no conflict, just the pretty gardens of a quiet cloister to the end of her days, until you notice the crucifix in the midst of the bouquet. St. Therese's idea of flowers was not an easy-going tiptoe through the tulips. To her, flowers symbolized humility and sacrifice. Love, she wrote, proves itself by deeds. So how am I to show my love? Great deeds are forbidden me. The only way I can prove my love is by scattering flowers, and these flowers are every little sacrifice, every glance and word, and the doing of the least action for love. She called herself a little flower, not to paint a pretty ego picture, but because she perfectly accepted that she was a mere violet and not a grand rose, part and parcel of her little way. Be the very best violet you can be, and bow your head when God allows you to be stepped upon. Far from a worldly message, but an irresistible one for Catholics struggling to save their souls in a world where pride is a virtue and sacrifice a fault. St. Therese's message of the little way has resonated in our era of particular spiritual difficulty, enabling souls to find a path through the quagmire of modernism and the increasing distractions of the modern world by leading personal lives of simple, practical piety. It was because of this spiritual blueprint that Pope St. Pius X, one of the greatest saints of modern times, called St. Therese the greatest saint of modern times. Marie-Francois Therese Martin was born into a solidly middle-class family in Alencon, France, on January 2, 1873, and led a fairly unremarkable childhood. She was only four and a half years old when she lost her pious mother, Zelie, to cancer, but little Therese received a careful upbringing from her equally pious father, Louis, and her four older sisters, all of whom eventually became religious. After overcoming numerous difficulties, Therese was allowed by exception to enter the cloistered Carmelite convent of Le Zieux Normandy at the age of only 15. In her nine years in Carmel, she filled various offices over time. She assisted the novice mistress, she worked in the laundry and the refectory, and served as sacristan, but was never remarkable amongst the nuns as one of particular outstanding virtue, exactly as one would expect from a religious who had mastered humility. For those nine years, St. Therese, whose name and religion was St. Therese of the Child Jesus and the Holy Face, fulfilled her daily duties to God, obedient to the rule of Carmel and to her superiors. It is due to obedience to her superior, incidentally her sister Pauline, who had become Mother Agnes, requiring that she write her biography, A Story of a Soul, that we have an understanding of St. Therese's holiness. That and the flowers she scattered down from heaven in the form of prayers miraculously answered after her death, as she'd promised she'd do. When I die, she said, I will send down a shower of roses from the heavens. I will spend my heaven by doing good on earth. The stories of miracles performed after the death of an obscure French nun spread quickly as her cause for beatification was considered during the first quarter of the 20th century. St. Therese was such a pretty little thing, and hers had been a life of obscurity untainted by the world, an irresistible picture of beauty in an increasingly ugly era. You can see how easy it would have been to form the impression that St. Therese was a lovely hothouse flower, carefully nurtured and too good for the wicked world. The lovely, rosy-cheeked, flower-laden portraits painted of St. Therese seem to tell this tale, and the worldly world loves the impression that the little way she's so famous for 
is an easy way. But St. Therese would be the first to draw attention back to the crucifix in her arms. I only love simplicity, she said. I have a horror of pretense and then speaking out against some of the claims made concerning the lives of saints written in her days, she'd said, We should not say improbable things or things we do not know. We must see their real and not their imagined lives. End quote. St. Teresa told us herself that her life, like ours, was a daily struggle to overcome her own faults and to put up with the faults of others. We know by her writings and by the accounts of other sisters that she tended toward scrupulosity and periodic dark nights of the soul, tendencies she worked and prayed hard to overcome. Life inside a cloistered environment is not as easy as one might tend to think. Religious, whether they're in convents and monasteries or out in the world, are like us, perfecting, not perfected. And personalities, even amongst the most pious, do not always gel. Daily, little Sister Therese had to struggle to work out her salvation in an environment where a pin dropped on the floor was tantamount to a junk car dumped in a suburban driveway. But she persevered silently, bit her tongue, and worked to perfect herself in humility and love of God and neighbor, in her smallness and by her surrender to the divine will. She wrote, I will seek out a means of getting to heaven by a little way, very short and very straight little way that is wholly new. We live in an age of inventions. Nowadays, the rich need not trouble to climb the stairs. They have lifts instead. Well, I mean to try and find a lift by which I may be raised unto God, for I am too tiny to climb the steep stairway of perfection. Thine arms then, O Jesus, are the lift which must raise me up even unto heaven. To get there, I need not grow. On the contrary, I must remain little. I must become still less. End quote. She worked and prayed at the Carmel of Lisieux for nine years, constructing her lift, or to us Americans, her elevator, until at the age of only 24, she lost an 18-month-long battle with tuberculosis. It's recorded that the pain of this horrible disease was so acute that in her last days she is recorded as having admitted, stoic little patient that she was, quote, I would never have believed it was possible to suffer so much. Never, never. But then in the end, perfectly resigned, she turned her head, her eyes focused upward as if seeing someone, and murmured, My God, I love you, and entered the joy that knows no end. She was canonized by Pope Pius XI in 1925 and is the patron saint of France, of missionaries, of florists, of orphaned children, and of those afflicted with tuberculosis and ailments of the lungs. Those uninitiated into the realities of St. Therese's life in the cloister miss that hers was a path of suffering made joyful and made fruitful by love. There are thorns in those roses you always see in St. Therese's arms, but see how she smiles in spite of them. Is that not what makes her holiness irresistible? What do you think? It's easy to want to ignore the thorns. It's tempting to imagine the little way is an easy way. But St. Francis and St. Therese both would be the first to tell you that in spite of the Eden-like images we often see of them, their lives were not walks in the park any more than ours are. They suffered sadness, disappointments, frustrations, failures, and insecurities. But their thorny uphill paths were worth every difficulty because they walked them with our Lord and the peace you see painted into their portraits is real. What fascinates us about the saints, and we see it clearly in St. Francis and St. Therese, is this peace of God that surpasseth all understanding. Who doesn't want peace and contentment for themselves? It's a natural and an irresistible desire. We're attracted to happiness. We see, the, the whole world sees this peace and happiness in the popular images of St. Therese and St. Francis. So these statues and paintings are a, a hook to holiness. How do we reel it in, though, for ourselves and others? Let's spin the St. Quote Rolodex for advice from some subject matter experts. St. Philip Neri, regarding the conversion of souls, says, First, let a little love find entrance into their hearts, and the rest will follow. And today's patron, St. Francis of Assisi, tells us, Start by doing what's necessary, then do what's possible, 
and suddenly you are doing the impossible. Because as St. Ignatius of Loyola assures us, God gives each one of us sufficient graces ever to know his holy will and to do it fully. Every part of the journey is of importance to the whole, St. Teresa of Avila adds. And nota bene, everyone has to start somewhere. St. Francis of Assisi reminds us, I have been all things unholy. If God can work through me, he can work through anyone. St. Francis de Sales confirms, all of us can attain to Christian virtue and holiness, no matter in what condition of life we live, and no matter what our life work may be. And St. Anthony Mary Claret tells us, Our Lord has created persons for all states in life, and in all of them we see people who achieved sanctity by fulfilling their obligations well. Holiness, says St. Therese of Lisieux, consists simply in doing God's will and being just what God wants us to be, a philosophy she likely learned from St. Teresa of Avila, her name saint in the Carmelites, who said it first, Be what you were meant to be, and you will set the world on fire. And if that prospect is intimidating, St. John Vianney reassures us, We can, if we will, become a saint, for God will never refuse to help us to do so. St. Francis de Sales tells us, It is not those who commit the least faults who are the most holy, but those who have the greatest courage, the greatest generosity, the greatest love, who make the boldest efforts to overcome themselves and are not immediately apprehensive about tripping. God takes pleasure to see you take your little steps, and like a good father who holds his child by the hand, he will accommodate his steps to yours and will be content to go no faster than you. Why do you worry? St. Alphonsus de Liguri has some practical advice for those who wish to progress in holiness. Were you to ask what are the means of overcoming temptations, he said, I would answer, the first means is by prayer, the second is prayer, the third is prayer. And should you ask me a thousand times, I would repeat the same. He continues, Those who say the rosary daily and wear the brown scapula, and who do a little more, will go straight to heaven. St. Louis de Montfort advises, Take advantage of little sufferings, even more than of great ones. God considers not so much what we suffer as how we suffer. Turn everything to profit, as the grocer does in his shop. And to explain why saints are happy, St. John Marie Vianney tells us, The happiness of man on earth, my children, is to be very good. Those who are very good bless the good God. They love him, they glorify him, and they do all their work with joy and love because they know that we are in this world for no other end than to serve and love the good God. End of quotes. I think it can be safely said, that holiness inevitably results in happiness, which brings us back to C.S. Lewis's quote, Holiness is irresistible. If 10% of the world's population had it, the whole world would be converted and happy before the year's end. Now, I call that a goal, my friends. We have it in us. Through Christ and his mother and with the inspiration of the saints, we can find the peace and contentment of holiness, save our own souls, and attract others to the true church, probably most of us in little ways, like St. Therese. But you never know. Don't discount the possibility that God has great tasks in mind for you, like he had for St. Francis of Assisi. One way or another, it's in us to be holy. We have a merry garden where we planted a couple potted mums two or three years ago, a humble but sturdy plant the mum, and an annual. But without our having to put a whole lot of effort into that end of the garden, those two mums have quietly broadcast seeds that volunteered each succeeding year into new little mum plants, so that the whole bottom of the garden is now a beautiful, multicolored mum paradise. That could be us. Be good. Put your best face forward. Plant seeds. As St. Francis of Assisi says, sanctify yourself and you will sanctify society. St. Francis of Assisi, pray for us. St. Therese of Lisieux, pray for us. Blessed be God in his angels and in his saints. 
You've been listening to the Catholic Family Podcast. If you enjoyed this show, please share it with your friends and family. You can support the production on Patreon and PayPal and you can reach Kevin at kevin89davis at gmail.com. Ad maiorem de gloriam. All for the greater glory of God.